Good day students, you are welcome to the Rob Tutors online class. My name is Sherson. Today, we are going to be taking a look at biology. This class is specially prepared for students preparing for various exams such as WIKE, NECO, NAPTEP, School of Nursing and the like. Now let's get started. Okay, so let's start by looking at the very first question and it goes thus which of the following statements about living things is correct then we have a animals respire using carbon dioxide as raw material we know that's wrong because animals always respire by using oxygen as a raw material b growth in plant is limited after some time growth in plant is endless not limited after some time c most plants respond to stimulus slowly that's obviously the correct answer because plants do not respond quickly to stimulus the same way that animals do. So the correct option is definitely C. If you look at option D, higher animals can reproduce asexually. We know that higher animals, human beings included, always reproduce sexually, not asexually. So the correct option is C. Most plants respond to stimulus slowly. Let's go to number two. Organ level of organization in living things is found in A. Water leaf plant B. Virus particle C. Kidney and D. Spermatozoon. Spermatozoon, by the way, is the singular of spermatozoa. The correct answer here is kidney. We know that kidney is an organ in higher animals. That is the organ that is saddled with the responsibility of osmoregulation. The correct answer here at the organ level of organization is kidney. Organs like kidney, like liver, like lung, and the like. So option C definitely is the correct answer. Number three. So diagram X and Y. X here and Y below are the illustrations of the transverse sections of parts of plant. We expect to study them and use them to answer questions 3 to 5. So let's take a look at question 3. Which of the following statements is not correct? Diagrams X and Y are sections of A, roots. That's definitely correct because if we could go back to that particular diagram again. If you look at the diagram again, immediately we see all these ones. We know they are definitely roots because all these are root areas and we know this is the piliferous layer so we know that these two transverse sections are definitely that of roots since we've established that let's take a look at question three again so this is obviously correct don't forget we are looking for the seven that is incorrect so a is correct let's look at b b a dicotinodonous root and a monocotinodonous root respectively that is also Correct, because we know both of them are roots. C, vascular bundles, that is also correct. The one that is incorrect in this first statement is stem, because, like I've explained earlier, all the two diagrams are actually roots. So here, we have roots here, that makes A to be correct. Then we know that diconodonous root and monocotinodonous roots, we have roots in both of them. That makes Option B to be correct too. Vascular bundles, if you look at the diagram, you can see xylem and fluent vessel there. Those are vascular bundles. So that makes C to be a correct statement. And D, which is the incorrect statement, which is the statement that is incorrect here. Yeah, that would be our correct answer to choose here. Yeah, so it is definitely D. The diagram, the transverse section that we've seen, a transverse section of roots, not that of stem. Let's look at number four question. The part responsible for conducting water and dissolved mineral salt from the soil to the leaf is labeled dash. Let's take a look at the diagram again. Now, if you look at the diagram, we will see right here, this one limb, that is labeled number one here, that is the xylem vessel. And we know the xylem vessel in plant does only one thing, and that is absorption of water and minerals from the soil. So that is xylem vessel right there labeled roman figure one so let's take a look at the options and see so right there so that's roman figure one a that's the correct answer let's look at it next question number five the part labeled two is the dash let's take a look at the diagram again 
So this is liber Roma figo one, like I've just said, that is the xylem. And then this here is what we are asked to find out what it is. And this is the pith, the very center of a monocotinodonous root is referred to as the pith, P-I-T-H. So let's look at the options to see which one is correct. Definitely option A, that is the pith. Number six, the organelles in cells, which are also referred to as suicide bags, are the lysosomes. Lysosomes are referred to as the suicide bag in a cell. Why are they referred to as the suicide bag? Lysosome always contain hydrolytic enzymes. The major function of lysosome is the destruction of dead or worn out cells or substances in the cell. So lysosome can destroy cells. It can bring about the death of cells. We refer to it as apoptosis. So the suicide bag, the organelle referred to as suicide bag in the cell is definitely ribosome. So that's, if you look at mitochondria, that's what we refer to as the powerhouse of the cell because it produces energy in form of ATP. If you look at C, ribosomes, they are only concerned with synthesis of proteins. And if you look at D, nuclei, that's the plural of nucleus, that is the centrally located organ in the body. It controls all other activities of the cell. So the answer here, suicide bags are also called lysosome. That is option B. Let's go to number seven. Now, number seven, the process that brings about the shrinking of a sparrogera cell when placed in a strong solution is DASH. That is definitely plasmolysis. Now, plasmolysis is simply defined as the shrinking of a cell when such a cell is placed in a hypertonic solution. Another name for a strong solution is hypertonic solution. So, a spirogera cell is placed in, say, a soft solution or a sugar solution. There will be outward movement of water from the spirogera cell to that particular sugar cell or the soft solution. And because of that, that particular cell will begin to shrink. And after some time, the vacuole and the cell wall will peel away from the plant and then the plant can eventually die. That is what the fatal as plasmolysis. So the correct answer here is option C, plasmolysis. Let's go to number eight. The region of a plant stem in which cells divide to increase in diameter is the dash. The correct answer here is cambium. As a matter of fact, this increase in the diameter of a cell that is brought about by the division of the cell, we refer to it as secondary thickening. So the part of the plant, the plant tissue that is responsible for increase in the diameter of that particular plant is the cambium. We refer to that as secondary thickening. We know that phloem, phloem has one major function and that is translocation. What do you mean by translocation? That is the movement of manufactured food from the leaves and other part of the plant where photosynthesis takes place to all other parts of the plant. So translocation is the movement of materials or manufactured food from where they are produced to all other parts of the plant. That is what phloem vessel does. If you look at xylem vessel, xylem vessel primarily helps in absorption of water and mineral salt from the soil to the plant. It has nothing to do with increase in diameter of the plant. And if you look at cholenchyma, cholenchyma among other functions are found in young leaves. It's a plant tissue, it's a plant, a plant in, what we to as plant tissues that help in giving strength and rigidity to plant, especially young plant. Kulekama is easily identified by the presence of thickened centers in them. So, so as not to waste our time, the correct answer here is cambium. It's cambium that is responsible for increase in diameter of the plant. Okay, so number nine, the total number of corda vertebrae in animals X and Y is four and 27 respectively. The animals are likely to be, immediately we see that four is present in animal X. We should know that is going to be humans because humans are the organisms that usually have four corda vertebrae. So that's going to be option D, humans and 
rat we know that coda vertebrae are located in the tail region and that is why rats are having higher number than humans because rats do have long tails while humans don't have tail as a matter of fact in humans the four coda vertebrae are fused together to form a single bone a blunt notch that is referred to as a coccyx now coccyx is spelled as c-o-c-c-y-x and don't forget that coccyx is also an example of a vestigial organ we know what vestigial organs are those are those organs that do not have any specific function that they perform in the body another example of vestigial organ apart from coccyx is appendix so the correct answer here is option d let's go to number 10. which of the following blood components has the greatest affinity for oxygen and carbon four oxide is definitely option b which is erythrocyte and underneath for erythrocyte is red blood cell we know that erythrocyte has one major function in the body and that is transportation of oxygen and transportation of small amount of carbon four oxide if you look at blood plasma blood plasma helps in transporting dissolved substances waste product hormones enzymes and so on and so forth if you talk about thrombocyte that's also called platelets the major function of thrombocyte or platelets is blood clotting if you're talking about lymphocyte which is option a here the major function of lymphocyte is to help in defending the body against infections and this is because lymphocyte is one of the five types of white blood cell the other four types of white blood cell apart from lymphocytes are we have monocyte you have eosinophils we have neutrophils and then we have basophils so the component of the blood that has the greatest affinity for oxygen a chemical oxide is definitely red blood cell option b erythrocyte let's go to number 11. use the following processes to answer questions 11 and 12. Roman figure 1, ribs move upward and outward. Roman figure 2, the half from relaxes. Roman figure 3, volume of the thorax increases. And Roman figure 4, air is forced out of the lungs. So let's take a look at question number 11. Which of the processes take place during inspiration? To start with, inspiration is also called breathing in or inhalation. So let's look at the processes once again. Let's go back to the processes. So out of these four processes, which of them actually occur during breathing in or inhalation which is also called inspiration we know that when, when we breathe in the ribs we move upward and outward so roman figure one is correct when we breathe in the half arm contracts they do not relax so roman figure two does not occur during inspiration roman figure three volume of thorax increases that's definitely correct because when we breathe in air goes into the thorax and because of that the volume of the thorax increases and then roman figure four air is forced out of the lung we know air is only forced out of the lung during expiration breathing out so the correct answer here there are only two processes that occur out of these four during breathing in and that is number one roman figure one ribs move upward and outward and roman figure three volume of thorax increases so let's look at the question and see the option that has one and three that is option a so option a one and three is the correct answer number 12 which of the processes is a direct result of contraction of intercostal muscles we know that during inspiration during breathing in when intercostal muscles when they contract the ribs move upward and outward so let's take a look at the processes once once again ribs move upward and outward that is a direct consequence of contraction of intercostal muscle that's definitely roman figure one so let's look at the option to see which one that's option a so which of the processes is a direct result of contraction of intercostal muscles that is roman figure one the ribs move outward and they move upward let's take a look at number 13. the process by which the amount of water and solutes in the blood are controlled is known as dash that is osmoregulation osmoregulation is the process whereby 
the water balance in the body and then the electrolytes are kept constant, are maintained at a particular fairly constant value. And that's the meaning of the process whereby water and solute in the soil are controlled. That is osmoregulation. And it will be interesting to note that osmoregulation occurs in humans in the kidney. Kidney carries out osmoregulation in humans, while in lower or unicellular organism, contractile vacuole carries out the function of osmoregulation. So the correct answer here is D, osmoregulation. Let's look at number 14. Now the table, the table here shows the effect of hormones 1, 2, 3, and 4 of some parts of the human body, where the right T represents the effect and then X represent the effect of hormones on represents no effect of hormones on the corresponding part of the body we have to study it and answer questions 14 and 15 let's take a look at number 14 now it says which of the following hormones are one two three and four respectively to be able to know that let's go back to the table and find out so Omon Roma figure one, it has effect on the heart. It has effect on the digestive system. It also has effect on the kidney, and it has effect on the uterus. The only hormone that has effect on the heart that increases heartbeat, that has effect on the digestive system, that has effect on the kidney and uterus is adrenaline. So Roma figure one, is going to be adrenaline. Now, if you look at hormone 2, we can see it has no effect on the heart, it has no effect on the digestive system, but it does have effect on the kidney. That is going to be antidiuretic hormone, ADH. It's also called vasopressin hormone. So let's look, look at hormone roma figure 3. It doesn't have effect on the heart, neither does it have effect on the digestive system. It doesn't have effect on the kidney, but it does have effect on the uterus. So then we can look at several, I think there are more than one hormone that does have effect on the uterus. Let's take a look at the options to see which of them. So here we can see the first one we spoke about was adrenaline. That's Roman figure one. The second one, because remember, it says respectively. So which means hormone number one. Is adrenaline. Hormone number two that has effect on the kidney is antidiuretic hormone. The one that I also said is also being called vasopressin. And hormone number three, which is a female hormone, is oestrogen. And then hormone number four, glucagon. Let's take a look at the table again. So we can see hormone number four, it doesn't have any effect on the heart. Neither does it have effect on the digestive system. It doesn't have effect on the kidney. And then it doesn't have effect, it does have effect on the digestive system, it doesn't have effect on the kidney, it doesn't have effect on the uterus. Now, we know that glucagon has effect on the digestive system because the function of glucagon is the exact opposite of the function of insulin. Insulin converts excess glucose into glycogen to be stored in the liver and in the muscle, whereas glucagon does the exact opposite. And what does that mean? It means it's going to, glucagon is going to convert glycogen back to glucose. So if a person is fasting, for example, a person is fasting, such a person has not eaten, the brain constantly needs glucose. So the brain is getting glucose regardless of either the person is fasting or not. Where is the glucose coming from? That is where glucagon comes in. Glucagon will now break down the excess glucose that has been stored in form of glycogen in the body. Glucagon will convert the excess glucose in form of glycogen back to glu back to glucose so that the brain can make use of that and don't forget that glucagon and insulin both of them are produced by an organ located in the duodenal loop that particular organ we refer to it as the pancreas so let's take a look at number 15 the hormones responsible for anxiety is that we know the hormone responsible for anxiety is adrenaline hormone. As a matter of fact, we refer to it as emergency hormone or the hormone for fear and fright. When a person sees anything or experiences something that frightens him or her, after a while, that particular person's heartbeat begins 
to increase dramatically. That is due to that particular person being anxious. That's anxiety. So the hormone responsible for anxiety is adrenaline and that is roman figure one that increases heartbeat let's go back to the table that's roman figure one that's adrenaline it increases heartbeat it has effect on the digestive system it has effect on the kidney as a matter of fact it actually reduces the rate at which kidney produces urine not only that it also has effect on the uterus and that is why god forbid if a if a woman is pregnant for example and then receives a shocking news maybe she receives a phone call telling her that maybe something bad has happened god forbid to a family member such a woman can go into premature labor because of the effect of this particular adrenaline which can increase the we can increase the contraction of the uterus and the contraction of the uterus don't forget is only expected to occur during labor and that particular labor can be induced before time pre-time due to the harmful effect god forbid if a terrible news was received and this adrenaline is produced and it increases the contraction of the uterus dramatically more than normal let's go to the next question now the diagram below that diagram of the mammalian air is an illustration of some part of mammalian air study it and answer questions 16 to 18. so number 16 the parts labeled one at the dash let's look at let's take a look at the diagram again so this is the part label one and as you can see here this part of the air is called the air ossicles now we know there are three air ossicles we have the malleus also called the armor we have the anchors, also called the anvil, and then we have the stapes, also called the steer rope. So the part label one air are the air ossicles. So let's go to the question and see air ossicles. That's option B. The correct answer here is B, air ossicles. Don't forget, air ossicles are bones. As a matter of fact, air ossicles are the smallest bones in the body. As a matter of fact, the smallest of the three of them is the steer rope or the stapes. So the part label one, as we can see, is at the air ossicles, number 17. Now, which of the parts are correctly grouped? Let's take a look at the diagram once again. Now, if you look at this, Roman figure 4 here is talking about the auditory meatus. Auditory meatus is another name for the air canal. That is part of the outer air. And... If you look at Roman figure one air, the one that we just finished speaking about, that is the air, these are the air ossicles. Air ossicles are located in the middle air. And if you look at Roman figure three here, Roman figure three air represents Eustachian two. So both air ossicles, Roman figure one and Roman figure three, which is Eustachian two, both of them are located in the middle air. And if you take a look at Roman figure two here, that's talking about the semen circular canals. That is part of the inner air. The same thing with the cochlear air, which is actually the organ of airing. So, in summary, Roman figure 4 air, that is the outer air. Roman figure 1 and Roman figure 3 here. Roman figure 1, that's the air ossicles. And Roman figure 3, that's Eustachian tube. Roman figure 1 and 3 are present in the middle air. While Roman figure 2 here which is the semicircular canals is present in the inner air. So let's look at the options that correspond to that inner air. That's Roman figure two. Like I just said now, middle air, that's Roman figure one and three. Roman figure one, talking about air ossicles. Roman figure three, that's talking about the Eustachian tube. And outer air, that's Roman figure four, talking about the air canal or the auditory Meatus. So that is that. The correct answer here is D, 17. That's D. Number 18 now. Um, the middle air is connected to the pharynx by the part labeled dash. We know the middle air is connected to the pharynx by the Eustachian tube. So the question now is which of these Roman figures 1, 2, 3, and 4 is the Eustachian tube? That is definitely Roman figure three once again let's take a look at the diagram roman figure three this here is what connects the middle air to the pharynx this air roman figure three air that's the eustachian tube don't also forget 
another function of eustachian tube apart from connecting the middle air to the pharynx is to equalize mm. is to equalize mm. the prayer in the air that is why most of the time if you are in a vehicle and that particular vehicle descends down a slope maybe descend down a hill we feel a little bit woozy or dizzy momentarily for a short for a short period of time few seconds and then we are normal again that's because when that particular vehicle descends down a hill the prayer changes because prayer increases with depth but the eustachian tube immediately realizes that and then equalizes the prayer and we feel normal again so the correct answer to that is roman figure three let's go back to the question that's roman figure three it is eustachian tube that connects the pharynx to the middle air Number 19. The diagram below are illustrations of two different cells involved in a biological process in mammals. We have to study them and answer questions 19 to 21. Now, if you take a look at this, we know this is a spermatozoon, a sperm cell. And if you take a look at this, we know it's an egg or an ovum. So let's take a look at number 19. Which parts of P and Q fuse to complete the biological process we know the head of the spam let's go back to the diagram again the head of the spam label 3 air will fuse with the nucleus of the egg to form that new organism there to form the zygote so remember figure 3 here that's the head of the spam that is where you can see the acrosome air and then this is the nucleus of the egg so the correct answer is going to be one and three or three and one let's take a look at the option to see which one is correct definitely option c three and one three represent the head of that particular sperm cell and one represent the nucleus of that particular egg so the head of the sperm has to fuse with the nucleus of the egg in order to be able to form a zygote hello students i trust you've been enjoying the class so far Please, it will mean a lot to us if you could hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you'll be the first to be notified when we have a new content. Also like, share and leave a comment. Thank you. Now, let's go to number 20. Which of the following statements about P and Q is correct? Have it, have it, don't forget, P is talking about the sperm cell and Q is talking about the egg or ovum both cells are structures for asexual reproduction we know that is wrong because sperm cell and egg they are only present they are only used for sexual reproduction not for asexual reproduction b both cells normally belong to the same individual that is also wrong sperm cell comes from the male and then the egg come fr comes from the female option c both cells are found in plants that's also wrong because plants and plants and animal cells are different in this regard animals produce sperm and egg plants don't produce sperm and egg not at all so the correct option here is option d the union of both cells the union means the fusion the joining together of both cells gives rise to a new mama so the correct option here is d the fusion the fusion of the fusion is also called the union the fusion of the union of the sperm cell which is p and the egg which is q will give rise to a new mama the correct answer here is option d number 21 if the number of chromosomes in the skin cells of mamas is 46 how many chromosomes will, will be found in P and Q respectively? Now, in the skin cells of mama, that is somatic cell. If the number of chromosomes in somatic cell is 46, then the number of chromosomes that are expected to be found in gametes, because that's what we call sperm, sperm cells and egg, they are gametes. And somatic cells always contain diploid number of chromosome diploid means twice whereas the gametes that's talking about sperm cell and the egg they, are, they contain haploid number of chromosome haploid means half so if 
the somatic cells, skin cells, contain 46 number, then both P and Q are now expected to have half of this 46. And what is half of 46? That is 23. So the expected number of chromosome in P and Q respectively will be 23 and 23. So the correct answer here is option A, 23 and 23. Number 22 now. Now, in which of the following structures is simple sugar produced? If you look at all the options here, they are, all of them are organelles that are found in a plant cell. But we know that photosynthesis is responsible for the production of simple sugar. And we know that chloroplast is what is responsible for photosynthesis in plants. So, simple sugar are produced in the chloroplast where photosynthesis occurs. So the correct answer here is option C, number 23. An evidence of the occurrence of photosynthesis in an experiment is the dash. Now, if you look at all the option, the evidence of the occurrence of photosynthesis in an experiment is the release of oxygen. Because we know that during photosynthesis, six molecules of chromophore oxide will react with cis molecules of water in the presence of sunlight, chlorophyll, and other enzymes to produce glucose, that's cis h 2 fo 6 and then to produce cis moles of oxygen. We actually know that oxygen is the only byproduct of photosynthesis. So if you want to ascertain, if you want to find out if indeed photosynthesis are taking place, then we look out, we ask ourselves, is oxygen released in the process because release of oxygen is one of the major evidence is one of the major evidence of photosynthesis so the correct answer here is release of oxygen because you know oxygen is released during photolysis of water that's the second stage during photosynthesis the first stage is the energizing of the chlorophyll and then the second stage involves photolysis of water photolysis means photo means light and then lysis mean the breaking down splitting so when water is splitted into hydrogen ion h plus and oh minus hydroxide ion the hydroxide ion now produces the oxygen that is liberated because you can also come across questions asking you that the oxygen released during photosynthesis comes from dash the oxygen released during photosynthesis does not come from chromophore oxide it does come from water so the correct answer here is definitely B, number 24. The major sources of vitamin A are, if you look at all the options here, option A, egg yolk, option B, carrot, and option C, uh, and option A, egg yolk, carrot, and palm oil. That is definitely the correct answer. Egg yolk is rich in vitamin A, and we know vitamin A is necessary for good Eyesight. Carrot is also very rich in vitamin A. So also is palm oil. The correct answer here is option A. Don't forget that this vitamin A is very, very important for eyesight. Deficiency of vitamin A causes what we refer to as night blindness. So and vitamin A can also be called retinol. Let's go to number 25. Diagram gel is a protease. Now, protease, by the way, is talking about an enzyme that is proteinous in nature, while diagram K, L, M, and N are food substances. Study them and answer questions 25 to 27. So, let's look at 25. Which of the illustrated food substances will form a reaction with protease G? Let's go back to the diagram to see. Now, you can see the protease. Remember, this is the enzyme, and we can see the shape of the active site here. We refer to this particular part of an enzyme where the substrate binds to, we refer to it as the active site. And this protein can only react with this particular substrate L here. Why is that? Take a look at the shape here. It will fit perfectly into the active site here. This will definitely not be able to fit to this. This 
will definitely not be able to fit with this neither will this be able to fit with this we can see that due to the shape of this substrate here it will be able to align and fit perfectly into this process j here so the correct answer is l let's go back to that 25 so that's going to be option b so let's go to number six number 26 now Protease gel will react with the particular illustrated substance because enzymes are specific in their action. They're specific in the action. They will only... Remember that enzymes work on the lock and key theory. It's just like you want to open the door. You want to unlock the door to your house. You can't use any random key that you see. You have to use the particular key meant for that particular lock. If not, the key will not be able to enter into it. Why is that? Because the teeth and the alignment are made for each other. The same thing. Enzymes are specific in action. They will only react with certain substrates that have a shape which is very similar, which can fit exactly into the active site of such enzymes so the correct answer here is enzymes are specific in their action okay so number 27 after a reaction between protease j and the food substance the end product will be dash we know like i've told you before protease is talking about a digestive enzyme that acts on proteins and when proteins are digested the end product of protein digestion are amino acids. So the correct answer here is C. After this protease gel will have acted on the full substance, the end product will be amino acid. Amino acid are the end product of protein digestion. Don't forget that proteins are not just broken down directly to amino acid. They pass through two stages. Proteins are first of all digested to form peptones. Peptones will be digested to form polypeptides and polypeptides are finally broken down to produce amino acid. So the correct answer here is amino acid. Let's go to number 28. The property of clay soil that prevents it from supporting thick vegetation is, is dash. Now, if you look at this, we know one of the effects, one of the problematic thing about clay soil is, is high water retention ability. It retains water so much that soil that are predominantly clay in nature are usually waterlogged because the water in them are unable to percolate and go into the soil. So the correct answer here, based on what I just explained, is option C, tendency of becoming waterlogged. We know that clay soil have high water retention ability and because of that it has a higher tendency of becoming waterlogged and any soil that is having a tendency of becoming waterlogged cannot support any meaningful or thick vegetation because the water will not the waterlogged soil will not be able to allow oxygen and other nutrients to be able to go deeper into the soil so that the roots of plants there can actually make use of them and flourish the correct answer here is option c let's go to number 29 which of the following practices will not maintain soil fertility preventing soil erosion will definitely maintain soil fertility bush following will definitely help to maintain soil fertility leaving the land bare that's the correct answer there leaving the land bare cannot maintain soil fertility when the sand when the soil rather is left bare that is there are no crop covering such a soil is going to be exposed to easy erosion at least soil erosion can occur and we know that when soil erosion occurs majority of the nutrients that should have been available in that particular soil would have been completely washed away either by water which is water erosion or by wind so that's that the correct answer there is leaving the land bare leaving the land bare cannot maintain soil fertility number 30 a group of organisms of the same species 
living in a particular place is known as dash. The correct answer here is population. Population is defined as a group of organisms of the same species living in a particular area at a particular time. That is definitely population. Please, do not confuse population with a community. A community is a group of organisms of different species living in a particular area at a particular time. So the distinguishing feature between population and community is this. In case of population, there will be a group of organisms of the same species. In case of a community, it will be different species. So a group of organisms of the same species living in a particular place is known as a population. Option D, number 31. The diagram below is an illustration of an experiment on sedimentation of soil. We have to use it to answer questions 31 and 32. Let's take a look at number 31. The organic component of the soil is labeled dash. Let's go back to the diagram again. Now, if a soil is poured into a beaker like this, and then we have water, the soil is poured into a beaker in which there is water like this. After a while, the soil begins to sediment. That is, sediment means they begin to stratify out, form layers upon layers. The question is asking us, which of these part labels 1, 2, 3, and 4 will be the organic matter? Organic matter will be the one that will be at the very top, that will be floating on top of the water here. That is definitely Roman figure 1. Let's look at the options and see. That is option A. So the organic component of the soil, the organic matter in the soil, will be at the top of that particular tube. That is Roman figure 1. One. Let's go to number 32. The part labeled 4 is, let's look at the diagram again to see. So this is the part labeled 4 here. This, like I've just said, is going to be the organic component, the organic matter. So the part labeled 4 here, we can see that this particular part labeled 4 is talking about the lowest part of that particular sediment that will become, that will be made up of sound. Sound. Let's look at the options to see the sun that's option b so the part label four should be made up of sand 32 b is the correct answer the sand number 33 which of the following pyramid is not used in ecology pyramid of we have pyramid of energy we have pyramid of numbers we have pyramid of biomass. We do not have pyramid of organism. The correct answer here is D, organism. There are no pyramid of organism. We do have pyramid of energy. We have pyramid of numbers. We have pyramid of biomass. There is nothing like pyramid of organism. So the correct answer here is option D. Let's look at number 34. We have to study this food chain and use it to answer questions 34 to 36. J to K to L to M to N. Let's take a look at number 34. Now, organism J normally is normally sustained by energy from... Let's look at the food chain once again. We can see J. We know that every food chain always starts with a producer. A producer is an autotrophic organism. An autotrophic organism is an organism that can manufacture its own food. And autotrophs like green plant, they always derive their energy from sunlight. So let's look at the question now. So organism J, that's a producer, like a green plant, is normally sustained by energy from, that's energy from sunlight, D. Sunlight is the ultimate source of energy. The correct answer here is D, autotrophs, like green plant. They always derive their energy, they, always, they are always sustained by energy from the sun. Number 35, which of the following statements about organism L is correct? Let's take a look at L again. Now, L, let's take a look at this. Like I've said earlier, J here, that is the producer. K here, that feeds directly on the producer, that is primary consumer. L, that feeds on primary consumer, is a secondary consumer. So let's take a look at the question 35 now. So. We are asked which of these four statements is correct about L. And we can see from my explanation that 
L is a secondary consumer. So the correct answer here is D, L. Because L feeds on primary consumer, L is definitely a secondary consumer. So option D is the correct answer. Let's take a look at number 36. The position occupied by each, by each of organisms J, K, L, and M in the food chain is known as dash. Now, the position, the feeding position of an organism is referred to as the trophic level. That's a trophic level. That's option B. The correct answer here is trophic level. The position occupied by an organism in terms of their feeding relationship, we refer to it as the trophic level. That's option B. Number 37. Which of the following fishes is not an adaptation of plant to aquatic habitat? Option A, breathing roots for entry of air. That's an, that's an adaptation of plant to aquatic habitat. Option B, flowers are raised above water to attract pollinators. That is also an adaptation of plant to aquatic habitat. Option C, spongy tissue containing gases for buoyancy. That is definitely another example of adaptation of plant to aquatic habitat. And D, which is the correct answer, airy structures on the leaves to reduce water loss. An aquatic plant in aquatic habitat do not have any need to prevent water loss. They are already in water bodies. So, as a matter of fact, they usually possess substances to prevent them from wetting. So, it is only plants that are located in arid land, in desert, where there are low amount of rainfall or water that need to reduce water loss. So, the correct answer here is D. Plants in aquatic habitat do not need any structure, like airy structure on their leaves to reduce water loss because they don't have any reason to reduce water loss. Hello students, I trust you've been enjoying the class so far. Please hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you'll be the first to be notified whenever we upload our new content. Please don't also forget to like share and leave a comment thank you now let's get back to the questions number 38 the biological association that contributes directly to succession in a community is definitely option a competition competition among various organisms in a particular habitat lead to the changes in that particular habitat until a climax or stable community is reached. That is what we refer to as a succession. So competition is the biological association that directly contributes to succession. The correct answer here is A, competition. Number 39, the conservation of natural resources is enhanced by the following practices except so the question wants us to find out which of these four practices does not is does not enhance conservation of natural resources controlling farm activities it does it does enhance conservation of natural resources protecting endangered species that also enhances conservation of natural resources the correct option here is C, poaching in game reserve. Poaching is defined as unauthorized, unlawful killing of animals in game reserve. So when a person poaches in a game reserve, such a person is, com is committing an act that will never contribute to conservation of natural resources. And that is why game reserve are no-go area for poachers because animals species of organisms in game reserves are meant to be protected to prevent them, especially the endangered ones that are more likely to go into extinction due to their reality. So the correct answer here is C, portion in the game reserve will never lead to conservation or enhance conservation of natural resources. That's option C. Number 40, the burning of farmland should be discouraged because it if you look at option A, destroy the organic component of the soil. B, increases the population of wild animals on the farm. C, increases the dormancy period of some seed. And D, destroy some plant pests. The reason why burning of farmland should be discouraged is because of option A. Whenever burning occurs on farmland, 
it destroys the organic component of the soil and we know the organic component of the soil actually contains a lot of nutrients and other useful microorganisms and when the organic component of the soil are destroyed that obviously impacts the fertility of the soil and by extension it affects crop yield so the correct option is a hello students i trust you've been enjoying the class so far Please, it will mean a lot to us if you could hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you'll be the first to be notified when we have a new content. Also like, share and leave a comment. Thank you.